Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is good to see you out there today. There's an interesting thing I looked up. It's uh, when you do something new, you don't always have all the information you need to do everything right. And you can make mistakes by being a little uninformed. And I looked up Thomas Edison and the late And he said he admitted that they went through about 3,000 different theories of light bulbs before they found two that pretty much got the job done, one that they really liked. So uh, it can take quite a while to get things the way you want them, the way it needs to be when you're trying to figure things out. So uh, keep that in mind today. Just this little something that came across that has to do with today's, today's sermon. I was at the uh, Philadelphia Baptist Association Ministers' Council meeting this week, and uh, one of the other pastors uh, spoke. We had received as part of an exercise pictures of different things, and were asked, you know, how does this impact you? And she held it up, and it was a trail going through the woods, and there was a bend in the trail, and she says, I'm always fascinated by trails. I want to know where they go. And I, I said, you always you feel compelled to follow them, like I do. Do you want to know what's around the bed? And she said, oh yes, always. I want to see what's coming around the corner, whether it's good or bad. In fact, somebody quipped, but what if there's something bad around the corner? And both of us responded almost simultaneously. I'm still going to look. I got to know. I got to see. Well, travel, going down that trail, finding out what's around the bend there, can be a really mind-expanding experience. I went to college in Indiana. I grew up largely in McLean, Virginia, and kept tripping over little differences when I got back to the Midwest. I'd lived in Indiana as a small child, but it had been a while since I'd been there. And so I was really confused by one of the first football games I attended where we were playing Miami. And Ball State was a little school. And what in the world were we doing playing with this team from Miami, Florida? And I asked somebody, and they rolled their eyes and said, that's Miami, Ohio. <laughs> oh. And I got really excited when somebody said that they were from Richmond, because I thought, oh, you're from Virginia, too. And they looked at me confused and said, no, Richmond, Indiana. Hmm. Oh. And it's really interesting, because you know you're at some place different, where you sit down in the, uh, the student lounge there, and you're watching the news, and up come the farm and the hog reports. Trust me, in McLean, Virginia, you didn't get those. That was fascinating. And you have a lot to learn, and you learn to appreciate the differences between one place and another, for instance, and the joys that come with discovering those differences like sugar cream pie, persimmon pudding, and for me, sherry. <laughs> the Magi from the East, they have stepped out on faith into an entirely different world. They went out from where they were and everything they knew and everything they expected they headed to Jerusalem, where the story was a little bit different, and we're going to see just what kind of complications that causes, because life gets complicated, doesn't it? Especially when you go someplace different. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> just had to play with them. The camera person's a little irritated right now. <laughs> now the Magi, they've been called kings, they've been called wise men. They were priestly sages from Persia. They are far from home. And they have very different ways. And this becomes obvious as the story moves along. They are extremely well regarded back home for their expertise. You see, they were the scientists of their day. They were astrologers. And they were dream interpreters. This made them very popular in high circles. Remember, Joseph in Genesis was really good at interpreting dreams, and he did it for Pharaoh's prisoners. And 
he ends up doing it for Pharaoh. And of course, there was this whole little business of having an interpreting a dream to his brothers that got him in endless trouble there at the beginning, but that's another story. So, they were used to interacting with royalty. It's one of the things they did. It was part of their job. It was what comes with having the knowledge that they had and the high regard in which they were held. They nob, nob them some pretty high circles. Now, while the Old and the New Testament will both warn against astrology, well, many rulers in many places still believed that astrological signs could have their own deaths written in the stars for them, which made astrologers very significant people to many rulers. And more on that later. We'll get back to that. God uses us all as we are and communicates with us in ways that we will understand. And it will get our attention by the things that interest us in this world. And that can be different for each of us. For instance, God got Moses' attention with a burning bush. Now why? Well, Moses is a shepherd, and any shepherd worth their salt is going to want to protect their sheep from danger. And wildfire would be a significant danger to the sheep. So you see the burning bush, it's got your attention right away. And so God uses a bright star to attract the attention of astrologers. And they're scholarly individuals, so there's prophecy that you can go with that, and that will catch their attention as well. And they step out on faith. They've seen the signs, their attention has gotten, and they are ready to go find the new king of the Jews. Now that's an interesting phrase because that's a phrase that will only ever be used by Gentiles. It is not used by the people of Israel. Only people like our scholars here who come from afar, only from outside. Now, these powerful and highly regarded individuals, they're not going to travel alone. Oh, no. They're going to have a whole caravan with all their stuff in it, and they're going to take their entourage with them, because that's how important people travel, and you don't want to have a chance of bandits getting anywhere near you after all, so you travel in a big group. It's the difference between getting an RV that's got the four parts that pop out of the sides, those are the really big ones, versus taking a pump tent. This caravan was the army. This is a big deal. And they head out. And they must be outsiders. They have strange ways. Because you'll notice they get close to their destination. And they have a problem that we have today with GPS. Here you notice he gets close there and it says, well, your location is up on the right. Somewhere. And then it shuts off. And you're not quite sure where. Well, they got close. But they weren't sure exactly where they're going. So, they head off to the city of Jerusalem. And they stop, and they actually ask directions. Men stopping and asking directions. These must be people from out of town. And the caravan's really big because Jerusalem is not only the center of power, it's also a big trade center. And if your caravan's large enough to get the notice of people in a trade city, that's pretty impressive. And that's what they've done. So, since they're looking for a new king, well, where do you go when you're looking for a king? Well, there's a palace right over here in town. There's a guy named King Herod in the palace. Let's go ask him. We're used to dealing with kings. We talk to them all the time. Let's go talk to this guy. Perhaps it's one of Herod's sons. We don't know. Unfortunately, the Magi were unfamiliar with Herod and his ways. Remember, they're from way out of town. King Herod is very concerned with maintaining his rule. In fact, he's not above killing people that he perceives as a threat to his reign. Herod represents, in this case, the imperial authority. And the imperial authority of Rome is no happier with people that they consider a threat. And we'll see this throughout Jesus' life. 
In fact, Herod even kept a secret police. And he sent that out to pacify the crowd in Jerusalem because they weren't too happy with Herod. Because one of the things Herod was known for was building. He was big on architecture. He built the second temple. And they said, no, it's not as good as the first. But still, he built the thing. He had or had it built, you know. And there were other places he had built. And what do you need on a public service project if you're going to build buildings? And where do you get it? You need money, right? And how do you get money? You, you ask for taxes. And needless to say, people were none too pleased with the ever-increasing tax rate to pay for Herod's new building projects. And hence the secret police that go and kept them quiet. So, so Herod doesn't take this very well when he hears from these sages that they're looking for a new king of the Jews. He takes that as a personal threat to his own authority and perhaps to his life. <coughs> now to tell you how this thing goes, especially now you, you link this now with astrologers. <coughs> those guys that can determine your fate if you're running a kingdom. Well, astrologers have told the Emperor Nero, or would tell the Emperor Nero, at one time there's a comet coming through, and that comet could be telling you that your reign is about to end and you're going to die. Nero did not take that well. And so he killed off a great many of his noblemen, hoping that their deaths would fulfill the prophecy rather than his own. So you can kind of see where this might go with Herod. But the wise men did not understand. So, they're simply asking directions. They don't know who they're asking and the threat that this will cause to Jesus. Herod's scholars, when they were asked, they knew where to look. They said, well, the scriptures tell us that Bethlehem is the town that you're looking for, not here in Jerusalem, because that's the home of King David. And that fulfills prophecy. Once again, this is not really good news for Herod, and King Herod is now afraid. And when a tyrant is afraid, everyone under the tyrant's rule fears how the tyrant will respond. So the whole city of Jerusalem is afraid, wondering what Herod is now going to do. And Herod takes aside the, this, these scholars, these magi, and he's real cool about it. He says, now when you find out exactly where this new king is, you come back here. And you tell me about it because, oh, I want to go worship him too. Yeah. The Magi didn't realize they just swatted the hornet's nest. Today, we have to decide who we're going to be when God does something new and invites us all to take part in it. When God gets our attention in ways that we're sure to notice. Will we disrupt our lives? Will we pack up our stuff? Will we head out in joy to be part of the new thing just like the Magi did? Now, I don't expect us to pull together a whole caravan, but will we do that? Will we be like those outsiders, those Gentiles, those Magi that God called? Will we appreciate it when God says that God, no, that God did uh, did that, saying to everyone that Jesus is for everyone. He's called these outsiders, these Gentiles from out of town, and he said, you're going to go and honor him. Says they would be amongst the first to honor Jesus. They're outsiders, and they're the first to treat him as royalty. Will we risk a few mistakes along the way to get the new thing done from lack of information? Or will we be like King Herod and the people of Jerusalem and overlook God's invitation? When God comes calling, they just missed it. The signs were there, they didn't see it. Or will we misperceive God's intent as a threat to ourselves? Will we be so mired in our fear that we refuse to act when somebody, even when somebody comes and tells us excitedly about this great thing that God is doing? Or worse, will we turn to cults 
that feed on our prejudices, our preconceived notions of reality, our painful desire for nostalgia rather than moving forward with God. As soon as the Magi have uh, their direction, as soon as they know it's Bethlehem and that is their destination, they take the whole caravan and they leave town. They head on out of the trade center there and they head off to that little town of Bethlehem with the whole caravan. That must have gained some attention. Outsiders called by God intent on honoring the newly born king of the Jews, the one the prophecy from Micah said was a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. To be a shepherd meant to tend it to the flock, to protect it, to guide and nurture the flock, everything a good shepherd would do. And it's a huge contrast with uh, King Herod and what he was intending to do, and the Roman emperor and what he would do that was for his own benefit rather than the benefit of the people. Notice, now there's something to notice here that should be shocking to us probably was shocking the first time it was heard, but we're so familiar with the story now, we just don't get it. And this shocking thing is that King Herod and his scholars and the people of Israel in Jerusalem, they had waited for this new king for generation after generation after generation for this Messiah. They wanted this to come, maybe not Herod, but the others wanted it to come, the Messiah of the people. But when they heard from a source they didn't expect that this Messiah was coming, not a one of them headed for Bethlehem. Nobody stirred, nobody moved. So mired were they in their local politics and their own special interests and in their own position and their own fears, they wouldn't follow where God would lead. They wouldn't heed the invitation that came from the Magi from the East. They refused. These Gentiles, these others, were representing something absolutely amazing. They represented the nations of the world that had been prophesied to come to the new king, to the Messiah, and bring the wealth of the nations with them, wealth fit for a king in the gold and the frankincense and the myrrh. And these people representing the nations of the world fell down in humble adoration of Jesus. And it's amazing that these kings were not flummoxed by their own expectations being so radically altered. After all, they'd gone to Jerusalem first. They'd gone to the big city, the center of power. They'd gone to the palace looking to find a new king. And they ended up in Bethlehem, in incredibly humble surroundings. But they were unwavering in their faith and in their belief in the new king to come. When in a dream they were told of their mistake that visiting Herod had been, and how potentially deadly it could be for Jesus and his family. They didn't argue about it. They didn't get puffed up. They didn't let their egos be hurt. They simply, humbly went home by a different and more difficult direction. They just went home without ever going back to Herod. And this story asks us all who we're going to be like today. God is doing new things in the world today. God is changing the way things are done. God is pushing for love of nature, na of neighbor, across all sorts of human boundaries and divides, changing the way we worship and calling us to participate in it. Will we be like the Magi? Will we be like the scholars from the East and accept that call with joy when it comes? Or will we be like King Herod and his chief priests and scholars and the people of Jerusalem who were so mired in their local politics, their personal interests, and their poisonous fears that not a single one of them would move in the right direction? God calls us in many different ways. If you're worried about that, don't worry about it. Because God will find a way to catch your attention when God wants to. Wherever your focus may be, God will send a message there. 
talking to us in ways that each of us will understand. God will call us. And there are many times when God has spoken to me in a variety of ways, sometimes through Bible passages that leap to life in a new way. Other times through books I've been reading, other times through the voice and the wisdom of mentors of mine, even from movies, and yes, once even from a source so ridiculous it made me laugh, the horoscope section, which I don't read, but something caught my attention there. And it was right. And it was another message from God, and it was, it was a relief. Don't worry about how God is going to reach us because God will. Worry about how we will respond when God does. We be like those outsiders. Be like the Magi from the East and be ready to pack it up and go. To follow where God leads, heedless of the mistakes that we will definitely make along the way. Humble enough to recognize them when they're pointed out to us and to make adjustments and always, always, always to seek after Jesus. Seeking the good shepherd, the one who will most certainly tend and protect and guide and nurture the flock, the compassionate ruler that cares for his people, who was willing to put his life on the line for each and every one of us. Experts say, there are many things that are making us like King Herod and his court in Jerusalem. Many things that keep us from being like the Magi, from seeking Jesus, from following God's invitation to the whole world. And this includes what somebody called workism, where you place work above all things. Others say divisive propaganda that feeds into our prejudices and sparks rage in us is another source because these are not the fruit of the Spirit that Jesus promotes. And a third is a staggering sense of loneliness that comes from being in a modern, mobile society. Each of us needs to grapple with and toss aside those impediments to be like the Magi, to follow Jesus, the light of the world, the light of the whole world. Let's pause for a moment of silence.